Hey y'all, a quick note before we get into this episode. I initially recorded this on, I think it was May 6th. It was about a month ago. And pretty shortly after I recorded this episode, the market tanked and panic set in and it no longer felt like a good time to release this bonus content. (laughs) So we gave it a beat and we are releasing it now because today's episode is about land-like assets and, and basically the decision by various metaverses and games to sell land in their games and whether or not that's a good strategy. And it feels like it's coming back into relevance. Recently, A16Z released an article about gaming and land. Alluvium, which is a, a big, I think, arguably AAA game, one of the first AAA blockchain games coming out uh, that has announced they're going to be releasing land as part of a game they're dropping. So I wanted to, to bring this topic of metaverse land sales back up, but do bear in mind this episode was recorded about a month ago. So some of the information in here may be a little out of date or may feel slightly less relevant, but I think generally speaking, this is pretty evergreen content and I hope you enjoy. Hello, everyone. GM, GM. Welcome back to another episode of Overpriced JPEGs. We got a special episode today. We may even release this as a bonus episode because I I pulled this together quickly in light of the other side, Yuga Labs land drop. Uh, There is somebody who I've admired for a little while now um, who really specializes in evaluating land-like assets in gaming contexts, and I wanted him to come on and chat all about it with me. So uh, today on the show, I have Lars Doucet. He's the co-founder of Level Labs, which is an independent consultancy that um, does analysis of of gaming generally, but specifically does a a lot of work analyzing blockchain games. Lars, thank you so much for joining the pod. So great to be here, Carly. Thanks for having me on. Okay. I first heard you on a podcast talking about uh, the problem with land-like assets in gaming contexts and specifically that you start to see dynamics play out like housing crises and and, and land shortages like we see in the real world, which I, I thought was fascinating. And we're going to apply this to things that Axie is doing and, and maybe to the, th- to, to the recent announcement by Yuga Labs. But can you just start by giving giving maybe your overview? What is a land like asset? What is your what is your perspective on land like assets uh, and, and why I wanted to have you on the show here today? Right. And so when I talk about a land like asset, what do I mean? It means an asset that resembles the financial characteristics of land. And so it doesn't mean you have an asset in your game and you just call it land. Because you can call it land and have it not behave like land. And you can have things that you don't call land that do behave like land. And so let's talk about what land is like, right? So in real life, have you ever heard the phrase, buy land, it's the only thing they're not making any more of? Or maybe Mm. you've heard the term, what are the three most important characteristics of real estate? That location, sales. location, location. Yeah, exactly. And so basically a land-like asset is any asset that fulfills, in my opinion, three characteristics. One is it's necessary for production, or you can interpret that as participation in the economic system. You, If you don't have it, you can't play. You know, you must be a landowner. Uh, second, it um, derives value from its location. So it the same exact sort of asset over here is worth a lot more than if it's over here. And then the third characteristic is that it has to be scarce in supply. You can't make more of it. And that can be either fulfilled naturally or it can be fulfilled artificially. And so one of the ways to create land-like assets is through government monopolies, right? You know, Mm -hmm. if you restrict access to something artificially, um, you can create something that behaves like a land-like asset. And when I say like, that can exist on a spectrum. The most land-like asset there is, is real-world land, right? Um, But also, um, orbital real estate functions the same way. Like slots, um, also slots on the electromagnetic spectrum, like, I don't know what the kilohertz range is, but like, you know, Froggy 77.4 FM is occupying, you know, electromagnetic real estate. And um, domain names are arguably kind of a land-like asset, you know? Like, is hamburger.com really being put to its highest and best use right now? There's a reason it 
you charge more for hamburger.com than hamburger.fart or, you know, <laughs> some unpronounceable But in theory, thing. wouldn't they not be, it's not, it's not scarce. Right. The good ones are scarce, but you, you could have an, let me ask you, I want to push on the, 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 you need it to play right? because it strikes me. There's plenty of games where you'd have land like assets where you can be in, you can be one of the people without land and play the game. Correct. Yes. And in fact, a lot of these virtual land economies are premised on the fact that there'll be landowners and non-landowners. So, so what it means is that it's so let's talk about necessary for production right so if you want to grow wheat you must own somewhere to grow the wheat um but in real life you need access to land to do anything you do when you think about it you don't necessarily need to own it but you need access to it and that's the key mm. if you can't mm. eat sleep work or even poop without access to land to do those things in and if you do those things in the wrong places or without permission bad things happen to you right even sleeping in the park um, if you do not have permission to do so, we'll get you hassled by the police, right? And so um, people can charge for access to their land, you know? And this is one of the ways that owning land gives you unique leverage over the economy. Um, there's that famous Silicon Valley um, kind of cartoon, which shows, you know, investors giving money to um, companies and there's this landlord over in the corner who's got a giant vacuum cleaner that's like sucking the money out of the hands of the companies that came from the investors. Um, and that's why, that, that's exactly what's happening in Silicon Valley right now. So to get to the point of production in games, it means there are resources that can only be created ultimately springing from the land. So the landowner, so, so someone who's not a landowner can wind up with those assets, but the landowners collectively decide how those resources get allocated they can. and it gives them unique leverage over the entire economy and so um there can be a sliding scale of the asset of how land like it is depending on how many of those three properties it fulfills a good example would be what i call a permit is not have a locational basis it has two of the three properties it's necessary for production like you can't brew potions in the game unless you belong to the potions guild and the potions guild will only give grant 100 permits uh whatever time unit you know so each of those permits is fungible, they're equivalent, it doesn't matter where it is, so to speak, but it's necessary for production and they're scarce, right? Um, and mm -hmm. so in one of my articles, I talk about how the more land-like it is, the more likely you are to have a recession, and the less land-like it is, the less likely that asset can be used as leverage over the entire economy as a speculative instrument. The more speculation gets attached to the most land-like assets is the argument. If you're starting on your NFT journey, you need MetaMask. This is your tool to unlock the world of DeFi and NFTs without giving up custody over your private keys. MetaMask is both a secure in-browser wallet and also a secure bridge for your hardware wallet so that you can connect to any Web3 enabled website. You can now trade tokens with any DEX or aggregator. MetaMask Swap gathers real-time pricing information across the DeFi exchange ecosystem, allowing you to select your best price while getting all of the MetaMask benefits of self-custody, lower gas costs, and increased transaction success rates. MetaMask also has a fantastic mobile wallet, which I use while I'm out and about, and I use it to collect PO apps, NFTs, and use it for all my DeFi things while I'm away from home. If you haven't downloaded MetaMask, you gotta try it out. Download MetaMask for desktop and mobile at metamask.io, or load up your Ledger, Trezor, Keystone, or Lattice hardware wallets so that they too can get into Web3. Rarible is the NFT platform that's leading the charge into the multi-chain universe ahead of us. Available on Flow, Tezos, Polygon, and of course, Ethereum, Rarible is the perfect place for NFT newcomers, profile picture collectors, and experienced NFT traders. Rarible has a variety of NFT features that set it apart from other NFT marketplaces. They have a native messaging function, allowing you to DM your friends or haggle with sellers. They also have a mobile app on iOS and Android with a built-in NFT portfolio tracker tool so you can easily check the value of your digital art portfolio. Rarible is built on the Rarible protocol, a multi-purpose, open source, and community-governed NFT protocol that helps build products and services across the NFT ecosystem, including white-label marketplaces tailored to specific NFT communities. So go to Rarible.com and start discovering and trading NFTs, putting in floor bids to join PFP communities, and DM with some brand new internet friends. So let me ask you a question. Uh, obviously, that's what we're here to do. Um, I want to ask you a macro question. I, I've now been following some of your work and as like a simpleton i stepped away being like screw it metaverses shouldn't be based in land like like the, the metaverses should be completely that, that should not be how they monetize is is through land they shouldn't be selling land at all 
Is that too strong of a viewpoint to come away with? Or do you agree when we're looking at these, whether it's sandbox to central land, other side, Axie Infinity world, that 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 this, these shouldn't be land-based? I completely agree. You know, um, I think there are various ways to deal with the problem, but it's under it's important to understand what the problem is. So why, why do people want to sell land in the first place? Because it's a great way to get a lot of money so you can go make your game. You could also sold effectively shares in the income that the game's going to generate. But by selling land specifically, you're doing two things. Is generally, you're working off of the metaphor of land to set up the expectation that that land is going to be a land-like asset, right? It's like, I'm going to get real estate in this new world, and I know how real estate works in the real world. And so that therefore, I have that expectation that that's how it's going to work in this game. And when it causes the inevitable problems that it causes, then people try to back off of it, right? Because unlike the real world, we can make more virtual land. We just promised we wouldn't, right? And we can promise to change the rules of physics in the game so that, you know, we do what I call land dilution to like make it so that people can participate more. And that tends to cause, once you've already sold the land, a landowner revolt because it's like, hey dude, I paid $4,000 for this thing. I have a reasonable expectation that I'm not gonna lose my entire investment and the whole point I played $4,000 is because I expected to have a net present value of income generated by my leverage over the economy that's going to happen. And so instead of rewarding your investors with like just a share of the income you're going to make from the game, you're rewarding investors basically with monopoly rights to extract value from other creators. And here's the issue. Every land-based game basically wants to be a UGC game, essentially, um, user-generated content game. Right, user-generated content. And the problem is it's, it, it, it doesn't really make sense because if you have a user-generated content game, I've worked in games for a decade, for about a little over, what year is it? Uh, 12 years maybe, let's say. And um, I'm very familiar with user-generated content platforms. I've consulted for Valve and Steam, you know, ship some code that's on the Steam storefront page. And I'm very familiar with like Steam Workshop and stuff. The classic problem every user-generated content game has, like Roblox is a successful example of one, is that when they first start out, like you have a chicken or the egg problem. Like you're creating a tool set that will let people make content that will make people come to your platform. But you need to have a bunch of awesome content before any players are gonna show up and start spending money. And you need a lot of players to start showing up and spending money before any creators are gonna invest in a proprietary tool set and learn like, like why would I invest in becoming a Roblox developer if Roblox is a ghost town? Only when it's already proven to be successful am I going to want to jump on that chain. And so you t typically have to basically spend a lot of money to solve one problem or the other. And typically what you do is it's like, here's our tools. Our tools are free. Hey, developers, come create. We'll pay you to create is, is typically what you have to do these days. Um, but this is like the opposite. It sets up an artificial barrier. It's like, hey, creators, you need to pay rent to landlords. Uh, what does the landlord do? He owns the land. So what, what are they contributing to this ecosystem? It's like, he is a middleman we introduced into the system that, um, that charges you money and stands between you and the customer. Don't you want to build on my platform? And it's like the very opposite of the so-called Web3 ethos that we're supposed to have of removing middlemen and not having all of these inefficiencies and you know kind, kind of illiberal aspects that everyone hates about Web2. It, it seems like we're adding more within this specific economic model. And that's why I think it, it, it's just got internal contradictions. I think the peop reason people are so excited about it is because it provably raises you so much money up front and it right. does so by selling you promises. And what's really interesting is one day those promises have to come due. You have to ship something. And then we immediately compare what is released with the promises we had in mind. And then that's kind of when things fall apart. Well, it's funny. I think you, you said at the start of this, selling the land is sort of like selling shares of future revenue in this game ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And right there, you start to see the problem, which is that, or, or to me, what's a problem, which is you, you've just guaranteed, or you've said you're going to get future revenue to the handful of people who were available and had the money at the, at the time of your sale to buy your land rather than who's ever most productive or contributive, contributive, if that's a word, yes. to your ecosystem. Exactly. But let me ask you this. Is there a world, obviously UGC tends to be a big part of these, these landed economies, but is there a world where you have these games that are going to sell land and then they're going to make all the investment to just make it a really fun game and people will want to be on it? Like it can, can, can that 
can it play out that way where it's not UGC based? Well, it just really depends on like what the land is for, right? I mean, you can ship a game where you have something in it you call land, but it doesn't behave in a way where it acts like land in the real world, right? Where it's not a land like asset. And, and land like financial assets are all about gaining and cornering leverage um, over other people's productive activities, things people want to do with that thing. People making people need to charge money in order to get access to a scarce set of things that are required to do the things people want to do. So um, to kind of like give some concrete examples, um, sometimes games will have um, like uh, the land like assets will only be a part of the game. So in Ultima Online, which has had a housing crisis since it started going on like 20, 30 years now, I forget how old it is, I forget how old I am. Um, if it, it only affects the housing sector of the game. If you don't care about houses, you just want to go play dungeons and stuff, like the recession doesn't affect you. You know, it's only if you want to participate in that part of the game. But if you want to participate in that part of the game, you got to pay out the nose to the people who've owned the land for 20 years. Um, and so I, I don't think there's a way to escape this problem if you set it up this way. Um, but going back to the whole point of shares is it's like it's all about how you reward people. Like um, a good example is how the Romans collected taxes. You know, if you ever read the Bible, you hear these people called publicans, sometimes translated tax collectors. Everyone hates them. There's a reason for that. The Roman tax farming system was the most regressive tax system in the universe. It was like, OK, I need a thousand sesterces or whatever to run the Roman Empire. Bob, go give me a thousand sesterces. He goes and be beats up 2,000 people to get 2,000 sesterces and keeps a thousand. And the other people each, you know, get twice as much as they were asked to receive. And so like a hundred times as many like sesterces were collected as were necessary for the running of the government. And there's this massive dead weight loss and just a bunch of thugs beating people up. And so it's like, you can collect the revenue for your economy that way, or you could collect it another way. And um, so I know selling shares in crypto takes us around the whole world of like avoiding becoming a regulated security. But the basic premise is, hey, investor, you provide me with capital. I need capital. I'm going to make this game. I'm going to make it valuable. I'm going to make people want to play it. They're going to pay me $5 because they want to play the game and it's fun. That is going to create ongoing revenue. Maybe they'll subscribe. Whatever my business model is, ads, sales, who cares? That will generate income. You deserve a share of that income as a return on your capital. That's one way. The other way is I'm going to create a world where people are going to be in it. They're going to trade amongst each other. There's going to be economic activity. And I'm giving you permission to extract economic value between transactions of people trying to do stuff in the game. And that imposes economic deadweight loss because it imposes a marginal cost on people's productivity. So it's going to make, you know, the rule is if you tax something, you get less of it. So if you tax people's incomes in games privately by setting up private tax agencies, which are what, which is what landlords are, they are private tax collectors, um, then you're going to get less of whatever the activity of the game is, which in most cases is some form of UGC. And I think you can expand UGC abstractly enough to cover basically anything that we've seen in land-based land games so far. There may be other things, um, but so far... I, it kind of stretches the definition of UGC a little, but it still broadly applies to everything I have personally seen. There may be more that I have not come up with yet. There may be possible that I haven't imagined, but that's mostly what I've seen so far, if that answers your question in a roundabout way. Yeah, well, I think what I hear you saying is like, no, my premise doesn't make sense. You can't have a land game where you don't need UGC because any activity on there you could consider UGC and the fact that you have certain people owning land is going to impact the amount of UGC you get either because you're going to turn certain people away because they're not going to want to pay whatever the the tax sort of is this private tax is or quite literally you're not going to have as many people willing to build on land because they can't afford it so either way you slice it right. by having private ownership of land you're disincentivizing activity in the ecosystem or you're defining um, for a whole group of people or you're redefining land to the point that it's not a land like asset like you can just make more land, at which point that's not how land really behaves. That's and that's clearly not what Axie or <laughs> other side or any of these are doing by, or, or they're just going to piss off a lot of people that are right. holding their land. Let's actually talk about that in the context of Axie, because this is something we saw recently, which is Axie landholders being quite disgruntled. Many of them bought into Axie land like a couple years ago in some cases. And I think Axie recently implied that they might be 
providing free land, mm-hmm. maybe not even applied. I think they, they said, you know, that that might be something that's coming. So while the existing landholders feel like you're going to dilute my purchase before you even built anything on it. Um, talk a little bit about what we're seeing play right. out with Axie and, and your opinions of it. This was exactly what I predicted they would do um, in my deconstruction for Novic. That's one of my consulting clients that I write for. Uh, so this article I wrote, Axie Infinity, Infinite Opportunity, Infinite Peril, co wrote with some people at Novic, was widely cited in a bunch of places like CNN and The Verge and um, was it Bloomberg or I forget. But um, anyway, we predicted that they would do this. It's called land dilution. And it's a way to make your land-like asset less land-like by, while still calling it land. And because it's, it's just not scarce anymore. Well, well, <laughs> it's or, like or, it's like money. It's like the Federal Reserve can just print more money. Right. And <laughs> Is so, money really scarce? And so you have those three properties. You can you can basically fudge on one or more of those properties. So you can keep it scarce, but you can make it so that you can participate in production in other ways, which mm. reduces the leverage of the landowner. Or you can print more land, which reduces the leverage of the landowner. You know, that that attacks the scarcity aspect. Or you can make it so that the location doesn't matter much. A good example for this is like, oh, there's teleporters now. So it's like, well, now the guy on Pluto has just as much access to Times Square as I do. So I don't have that unique leverage I had. And so I actually kind of, you know, as much as I, you know, have my gripes about land ownership and stuff like that, it's like I kind of, you know, I understand very rationally why the landowners feel this way. They're like, in a way, they're right to feel this way because it's like... To feel grieved. Yeah. In the Axie Infinity case. Right. They were made a promise that they were going to get an asset that would behave this way. You know, whether it was explicit or not, the marketing implied, when you, when you say it, you're selling land, it's really clear that this is what you're selling. That's why we're using the real estate metaphor. And it's the promise of there's going to be this world and I'm going to own a piece of Manhattan and that's only going to go up in value. Um, and we can talk about locational effects and the fact that your neighbor, your your competitor can always create a new virtual world, that land can never truly be scarce in a virtual world. That's its own subject. Um, but the point is, is that it's like it dilutes the net present value of those gains. And all this time, there's all these other opportunities. So the so I've locked up my asset in this. I have for locked have, up money in Axie land, right. which took away from my ability to invest in any number of other things. Right, which are all like, and there's so much FOMO to be had at any moment of, well, that went to the moon and that went to the moon and that went to the moon. Well, I'm holding this bag. And now this guy's telling me that he's, you know, gonna gonna change the conditions of this, and now it's also been delayed, right? So they're right to feel this way. Um, I, I very much sympathize with with all of the gripes about them, and I, I predicted that they would happen. Um, because the um Sorry, I lost the thread for a second there, but but the whole premise of it is that they're expecting this game to be delivered and that they're going to be able to operate on these terms. And then that didn't happen. Or there's the problem. Yeah, well, well you know, I, I, there were some people who were like, I, I gave a whole rant about why I think uh, Yuga Labs totally messed up by selling land for other side. One of which is I'm like, Yuga Labs should be shooting as big as possible. Like they, they should be shooting to be the Oasis from Ready Player One, where everybody is logging into the Yuga Labs other side metaverse. And this is not that, this is not that ambitious. This is a hundred thousand plots of land. I think I apparently erred and said 55,000 and it's actually going to be a hundred thousand. That doesn't, that's so, that's such a trivial point in the broader context of what I'm trying to say, right? right? Which is it's so limited. And people are like, well, this can be solved in all sorts of ways. And I'm like, look, is, is there a world where maybe they are able to deliver a lot of value to these first initial landholders, which then means it's at the expense of other players and then additionally expand and create some huge universe that can come become the oasis and everyone's happy because ultimately all the consumers can play in the oasis and these these uh, initial landholders are, are, get a return. It, yeah, maybe they can do all of those things, but um, it feels like they're setting themselves up for a a, a, a harder a harder road right. than uh, starting from that place. There's two Is, things. Would that, there's two things to talk about. One, I want to say something about common land that you talked about earlier, like free land. And then second, yes, it sets up an inevitable conflict, which is the oldest conflict in human history, which is the landowners and the landless. Why do we have wars? What is the number one cause of war? You have the land and I want it. That is that like almost any war can be summed up by that fundamental conflict. Why do peasants rebel against the king? Because, or the, or more frequently, the nobles. Sometimes the king will ally with the peasants against the nobles. <laughs> but like, like, why do the peasants rebel against the people above them? Because they own the land and we don't. Why do slaves rebel against their slave owners? Because they own the land and us, 
but you know, and and yeah, some extra dynamics that play in slavery. But yes, yes, right, right, right. Sure. But but even after slavery was abolished, the leverage of landowners still allowed a very slave-like operation through sharecropping to persist because they didn't get forty. The slaves didn't get forty acres and a mule. It's like they had to go right back to their former owners and who still maintained a lot of leverage. Anyway, that had a ton of leverage because they they owned land. Right, and all of the social forces. That's a whole other subject. But yeah, and so anyway, so. Talking a little, so, so you basically set itself up where the problem with most blockchain games already is they don't have enough users, right? Axie kind of got around that by just paying people to play, which caused its own problems. But um, if you compare these games, daily active users, monthly active users to other games, it's like, like good user counts for blockchain is a phrase, right? And it's like significantly lower than what we tend to see in other much more successful video games. And um, so putting this land ownership requirement on it, like I just measured the axi land and it was like I, I don't have it in front of me but like 30 or 40 accounts on half the land now i'm sure some of those are guilds that hold land in trust of however many hundreds or thousands of investors are in there but like how how concentrated is ownership of the guild i'm sure like a couple of people owned more than half the guild so however you spool it out there's not that many bag holders of land and um it, it fundamentally limits participation. And then um, talking about the free land, going back to land dilution, it's really interesting. All these metaphors have all happened before. They all have precedent in real life. So in England, very famously, have you ever heard of the Luddites, right? That's an yes. insult we have yeah. for people who are who against don't like the progress. technology. But yeah. the Luddite revolution was actually about land rights. And it mm. was about the fact, because if you want to build a factory in Europe to do this industrial revolution, there are key points of leverage on the map, specifically places with access to water power in order to run mills. And so previously, a lot of land in England was held in common. It was anyone could use it, which means that, um, you know, the average peasants, you know, in a sense were richer than they could have been because they didn't need to pay rent to access this common resource. They just shared it. But the government of England, you know, big government came in and enclosed the land and gave it out as favors to private interests who then invested capital. And the peasants did not have the ability to pool capital or, um, or charge collective rent as a community to a capitalist who wanted to build a um, investment on the river. And so they um, took it out and they, they took it out on the factory owners in the Luddite rebellion. And this was framed as being anti-technology, but at the root cause of it was a struggle over land rights. And so common land is this, the, the natural state of the world. And then it gets enclosed in parcels and shared out to private interests who leverage it against others. So it's really interesting to see common land, free land coming back as a policy idea and then landowners being very threatened by it for obvious reasons. You know, um, and especially, you know, when it didn't exist in the first place and you sold on this premise, it's a breaking of your promise. And so no wonder they're upset. Anyway. I want to talk about solutions. Yes. I want to talk about solutions you've proposed once you've already sold land. I want to talk about alternative ways to be designing these metaverses and monetizing them if you are Yuga Labs, for example. But I, there was an example I heard you give at one point that I thought was interesting about, um, it was Microsoft and the arcade their like limited space in their arcade oh, yeah, games yeah, yeah. for Xbox yeah. that I thought was interesting. Can you can you um, explain to folks what happened there? Okay, so Xbox Live Arcade was in the at Microsoft Xbox 360 was one of the first innovators to have digital distribution. Um, they totally let Steam eat their lunch for breakfast. Like they should have. They were there first with digital distribution. It was really cool, and they could have had this like big thing. Um, and it was really innovative at the time. So you could just go onto Xbox 360, Xbox Live, and like download games and pay for them. This was completely new. It was so cool. Um, and um, but they artificially limited how many slots there were. And this is normal. Okay, like it's probably really like intensive, and there's a lot of hands-on work to like ship console games at the time. Like even if digital shelf space isn't scarce, like just being able to manage all this really for bunch of complicated reasons I won't go into. Maybe they only had the capacity to ship 50 games a year. So they artificially limited these slots of how many games they were going to ship. But their management regime allowed um, what we call a, um, a natural resource rent to accrue to those slots because they just gave them out to people. 
they, 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 they didn't like be like, okay, we have 50 games. They weren't discerning about it. Right, right. They were just like, hey, um, Namco, you get five. Ubisoft, you get six. And I'm sure there was some deal where they did that. But then Namco would go around and be like, oh. Ubisoft would be like, oh, hello there. I see you want one of my... I can't do a French accent, despite my last name. It's like, I see you want one of my slots. You will have to pay the rent if you want this slot, you know? And so they had this, like, real negotiating power over anyone who didn't have a direct relationship with Microsoft. Because it's like, there's only three slots left this year. Oops, two are already gone. This is the last one, you know? So you had to, like... You had a, I, I was trying to publish an Xbox 360 game at the time, and there was this random, weird, little, like, fourth-rate publisher that had this slot, and we had to, like, try to negotiate with them, and it went really badly, and we wound up not getting the deal um, because they artificially constrained this and then managed it in a very haphazard and unthinking way. And again, the, the the lesson there to me is that you're not letting the best content bubble up. Yeah. It's you, what, you're, what, what you're losing if you're Microsoft is having the best content on your arcade games because it becomes who can afford to put a game on here. And that's that gets us back to the UGC problem. If you sell land uh, and you're in any way reliant on, on UGC, or I guess specifically the kind of UGC where you're actually building on the land in some capacity, you're not optimizing for who's going to create the best experience. You're optimizing for who can afford it, who was around when you sold it. Um, th- not things you should be optimizing for. And not just who can afford to pay rent, but people who can afford to negotiate with the landlords. Because in um, just like in real life, we are now starting to see the beginnings of virtual homeowners associations and virtual mm. NIMBYs who are artificially like... There's people in the sandbox who are complaining about the fact that someone built something ugly next to their land. And so they're starting to talk about, we need to exert governance. We're supposed to have governance as landowners, right? So we need to have on-chain governance that's going to make it so that you have to get a vote of all your neighbors before you can build in the sandbox. And so it's like... Where this will lead us to solutions. Is is there ever a context in which you think land should be sold in a virtual game? Are, are there contexts in which this is the correct... Yeah, well, I think you just... Um, so... I don't think you should start with the idea of a land-like asset. You can wind up there, right? Um, I don't think you should see it as a goal, but if you find yourself winding up there, there are ways to deal with it. Um, And there's a lot of weird and interesting ways to deal with it. And so the most important thing to realize is why do locations hold value? They hold value because of people. Because um, Manhattan has some properties, I'm sure, because of the conflicts of like rivers and stuff that makes it particularly valuable. But the reason it's valuable now is very different from the reason it was valuable 300 years ago. The reason it's valuable now is because there's a bunch of people there. Italian restaurants. What? No. <laughs> yeah. And Italian restaurants and like the, I, the food. I, I stay in New York city cause I want the food unlimited at 3 AM <laughs> Yeah, is why I'm still here. Right. Right. You know? And it's like, if you were to take that same Italian restaurant and put it in the middle of Nevada, the value to that Italian restaurant would be less than if it's like, oh, I have New York City here. That's providing value to me. And so it's it's this agglomeration effect. So even if you have an infinite plane of infinite land, as America approximately is, because like we got plenty of land in Nevada, you know, it's because the agglomeration effect is what we call in economics, like value accrues when people cluster because people, your neighbors create value, like an aura of value just shining off of themselves. And that value is captured by private um landowners in the value of land. That's what's going up when land is going up in value. And so talking about solutions, you know, so if you wind up with a game that has a sense of location, you're going to wind up with land-like assets sometimes whether you want to or not. And then you have to And again, just to, to really make a fine point on this, the alternative would be, okay, suddenly teleport is allowed, uh, teleporting is allowed in the game. You could solve that. That makes the consumers happy. But now the landlords are mad because that's right. diluted the value of their land and you sold them land telling them it was going to be valuable or worth something. So that's just want to really make it explicit that that right. problem that you, you paint yourself into. Okay, and continue. also, you've also changed the nature of your game. It has a diminished sense of place if you can teleport anywhere, right? Mm-hmm. So it's not just financially different. It's, it's, it's just completely different. It's like there's, yeah. if you want to create these gathering hubs and like towns and stuff, adding a little friction from a game design perspective can be good. Sometimes you don't want to perfectly like, like there's a lot of games. It's like, I want to have like a bustling bazaar. Well, now you can't have an auction house because if the market's too efficient, you don't have the hustle and bustle, right? So there's, there's game design considerations and not just financial dis- dis- considerations. But if you want to talk about solutions, um, so let me talk about one that's probably pretty salient that a lot of people have had experience with. Reddit slash r slash place is a really interesting experiment in land ownership and land management rights. And it 
uses what I call an attention tax to determine who gets to hold the land. And it's just, it's kind of the way animals allocate land in nature is just by like, I'm here. If you want it more, you come and like basically shove me off. Fight me for it. it. (laughs) Yeah. You know, in another way, like uh, in my paper, I call it, you know, like blood taxes where basically like combat is a way we allocate land in real life. It's easy, usually easier to defend than to attack. And I'm not going to invest more in protecting this land than it's worth. So if I have like, like when we were playing Reddit slash Arf Place, me and my friends. So like I was with team Georgist and Georgist. Can you explain what Reddit slash R slash Place is? Because I don't know. Reddit slash R slash Place is this great experiment. It's a giant canvas and it's got like 12 colors of pixels. Every five minutes you can place one pixel or maybe it was every one minute. I forget. That's it. That's the whole game. And people are building collaborative mosaics. And so... Mm. How do you get to draw a cool picture? You get all your friends and you collaborate like, this is our picture in our Discord, fellas. Okay, let's click here, click here, click here. Oh no, the Swedes are coming. And so there'll be this giant Swedish flag and it's just marching towards you. And you're like, put up a barrier. And then like right next to you, you know, will be like a transgender flag or something. And it's like, we must protect our transgender allies because they are our buffer state between the Swedish menace and us. And if their nation (laughs) falls, then we will surely fall. And it's like, oh no. The Swedes have, have have taken over that territory. It's like, that's okay. They're a refugee state now. We've allocated this land for them so they can come out here and they'll protect us from the Finns who are advancing from the South. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know? Wait, and so how did you win land through blood in, in that? So blood, in blood taxes, it's like, I use that in my paper to talk about like in a game where you have like little armies that go and take land, right? You don't pay okay. money for land, you pay blood. You know? But so you weren't using that in in the pla- in this Reddit place yeah. scenario. There a, wasn't a bl- yeah, there wasn't a blood opportunity. We're fighting, but you we're couldn't. fighting with attention. Got it. You know, we're fighting with fighting attention. It's sweat instead of blood and time. And so, like, okay. you'll well, well, a good example would be like we were, and you would make allies, right? You know, we would have the neoliberals were below our section, and we were the Georgists. Georgists are economists who care about land, and. We had our little, um, our banner, and we had an alliance with the neoliberals because they were bigger than us. So they would maintain our banner against incursions. Oh my um, God, I love nerds. So that we could, <laughs> so so that because we were a buffer state for them and they liked us, you know? And then we noticed that it's like, well, we want to expand this text here. We have too small font. Let's do it in a bigger font. And then it would get erased. And we're like, oh, our allies are giving friendly fire because... Um, because they don't know that we're trying to do that and they think it's vandalism. So let's send some diplomats to their Discord to explain the situation. They're like, it wasn't us, bro. And then we check the links and it's like, oh, it's coming from the furries, our neighbors to the east. I didn't even know they were our allies. And they're like, yeah, we're just protecting you guys because we're going to be next. If you are like, okay, we'll work this out. So anyway, my point is there are emergent ways of managing these things. There's no permanent ownership. There's no title in r slash place. It's just, do you care enough to be here? Can you see a context like this? Could this be a solution in like the Axie game world or it's, it's, uh, that's unlikely to work as a solution for like, I'm trying to so now this is how anchor e- us in the context of this these is how Eve me- online. metaverses. This is how EVE Online allocates land essentially, but they do it with weapons. So okay. there's turf wars all the time in EVE Online and it Reddit slash r slash place is a really anxiety filled thing. You got to be on 24 seven to maintain that. And so a lot of people have like a problem with the fact that it's like, I'd like some security, like, even if I don't am not a permanent owner of land, maybe I could be like a tenant for a while. You know, it's really obnoxious that I got to sit here and defend it. So I bring up r slash place and Eve is kind of like the state of nature, right? You mm-hmm. know, and then there's the state of maximum privatization, which is what's going on in your typical blockchain land games. So is there something in the middle that's more reasonable? And this okay. is um, probably getting at the solutions you're interested in. And so yeah. first of all, I don't think you should artificially create land like assets. But if you find yourself with them anyway, then here's how to deal with them. And one of them is what we call a land value tax. This comes from Georgism, which is my economic philosophy. It's been proven to work in a lot of situations. It's also um, closely associated with the notion of universal basic income. And you'll be familiar with UBI from your time on the Yang campaign. Amen, Um, baby. The UBI fan. Yeah. And so land value tax basically says we ought to tax it's similar to a property tax, but it's very importantly different in one respect. We don't tax the building, just the land, right? So in San Francisco, it's very easy to find like a house that costs like $3 million and an empty lot next door of the same size that costs like $2.75 million. So like do the math, the land is worth $2.75 million. The structure's worth like quarter million. You're mostly paying for the dirt. 
you know? And so if you tax the dirt at its rental value, like the value to basically park a bunch of cars there all year, right? The income you could get from just like charging for parking there. Um, if you were to charge that value every year, you remove the entire speculative income of the property, right? You return that to the community as say a universal basic income. And mm. because you're taxing the one asset that no one can make more or less of, you break the rule of taxation that says if you tax something, you get less of it. You don't get any less land because you can't because no one produces it. Mm. So let me see. Do I understand this right? So you're saying, uh, it, let's use the San Francisco land example. Uh, okay, if you build a house on here and the house is worth $3 million, but the empty lot next door is worth, let's say, $2.5 million, that house has a, a, an, a value of, of really basically half a million. Yeah. So you're saying charge the person, charge the... the, the you know, tax people at two and a half million a year if you have that plot of land. Not because with that, quite, oh no. Not quite. Because not quite, I'm not charging me. you 100% of the value of the land. I'm charging you the rental value of it. Like basically, if I was going to rent that land from you, out from under you somehow, charge you that amount each year. Okay. So that's a number that we haven't identified in this hypothetical. Is that what you're saying? Right. Well, what you do in practice is this nerdy thing called a capitalization rate. It's between five and 10%. So five and 10%. Right, Cause you're not going to tax them the whole, you're not going to charge them. You're not going to charge them a tax of the whole thing annually. Cause that would make no sense. So it basically it has to be some number that's right. less enough. The, the actual just like lump sum value of it. Let's say, you know, the, because yeah. say the empty lot is a parking lot. How much income is it generating a year? Tax on that. Okay. And then because what that does is it incentivizes them to do something productive with the land and not just be a speculator who sits on it. Right. It means you're going to lose money if you just sit on it. But if you're going to build something productive on it where you can make more than whatever that rental tax is, then great. And so it incentivizes you being productive with the land. That's is that what you're describing? That's exactly what it does. And this was um, tested empirically in EVE Online and it worked. Um, and what's so funny is the economist who did it had no idea who what Georgism was, or Henry George, the guy who created the Georgist philosophy, he independently re-derived it. This has happened multiple times. They just independently re-derived it from first principles because it solves this problem. When, um, so what, what, what we're talking about is when you Im implement a perfect land value tax, where you tax away the whole passive rental speculative value of the land, the selling price of the land drops to zero. Um, it still generates that rental income, but that's redirected to the community. So what basically happens is that the land becomes basically free to buy, but expensive to hold. And so if mm. you're going to hold the land, you're basically renting it from the community. So if you're going to rent this land and we'll, we'll use the rent to pay UBI or whatever we want to do, um, then I need to justify it. I need to make, it's like if I've got prime land in the middle of New York City and there's a parking lot there and you're charging me all the income I could make of having it as a dumb parking lot, I need to do something more valuable with it, like build at least a parking garage. Because every floor of that garage is free income for me above the value of just the boring land income value. Or let's say I have like a hot dog stand on land on a giant lot in the middle of New York City. It's like people want that for housing, people want that for restaurants, people want that for a million things, and that bids up the price. So if I am just willing to put a hot dog stand on it, I'm going to sell that land, right? And a bunch of other people are too. And that's going to depress the price of land. It's going to end the housing crisis has been, you know, pretty empirically demonstrated. And um, it's going to make it so no one wants to hold on to land unless they're going to do something that justifies holding on to it. Living a bankless life requires taking control over your own private keys. And that's why so many in the Bankless Nation already have their Ledger hardware wallet. And brand new to the Ledger lineup of hardware wallets is the Ledger Nano S Plus, a huge upgrade to the world's most popular hardware wallet. With more memory and a larger screen, the Nano S Plus makes it easy to navigate and verify your transactions. And the paired Ledger Live desktop app gives you increased transparency as to what is about to happen with your NFT. What you see is what you sign. The Nano S Plus gives you the smoothest possible user experience while you're doing all of your crypto things. So go to the Ledger website to check out the features of the new Ledger Nano S Plus and join the waitlist to get yours. And don't forget about the Crypto Life card, also powered by Ledger. The CL card is a crypto debit card that hooks right into the Ledger Live app, right next to all the DeFi apps and services that you're already used to doing, like swapping tokens and staking. So if you don't have a Ledger hardware wallet, go to ledger.com, grab a Ledger, and take control over your crypto. It's increasingly obvious that everything will become tokenized and NFT marketplaces needs robust financial reporting, performance analysis, and the peace of mind that they are compliance ready. 
Gilded's NFT Ops is a one-stop financial reporting solution for growing NFT platforms. Gilded has developed marketplace-specific modules to track the financial performance of NFT creators, including revenue tracking, collection metrics, royalty payments, and revenue share. Customers of NFT Ops gain full access to accounting tools and powerful APIs for custom integrations that simplify operations, streamline reporting, and produce tax-ready data. So no wonder why so many top brands like CoinMarketCap, Gitcoin, Nifties, and Poap trust Gilded to automate complex reporting workflows. Visit gilded.finance slash bankless to learn more. Okay, I know we're running short on time because you have a hard stop here in a few minutes. And, and the, the, the final question I want to get to is alternative ways to build a metaverse. So starting from first principles, okay, screw this whole land thing. And I want to get your thoughts on that. But but I, I, I just want to stay on this point and, and make it crisp. So this would be something that Yuga Labs with their other side land, or let's let's use it because you know it's a little bit ambiguous still what they're doing. The, the sandbox might choose to do this. You have all these people who buy this the sandbox land. We know they do it speculatively, right? They're just holding it. They're not themselves game developers. They're holding it because they think it's going to be valuable down the line. This would eliminate the incentive for them to do that, so that the land ultimately winds up in the hands of somebody who's going to do something interesting and productive with it and uh, create more value for the sandbox as a whole, make more users want to come join it, whatever, et cetera. Is that the the idea? Yeah. You know, I think it's hard when you've got one of these games that has leaned so hard into them to switch gears, even with a perfect policy, without triggering a total collapse that comes from a landowner revolt, right? The best approach is never to set yourself up for a landowner revolt in the first place. But um, Yuga Labs and the sandbox, you know, there, there, there's other approaches rather than the land value tax. The point is to capture that 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 ground rent, we call it, the land rent. You can do that by, you're the game developer, you can just rent it all out on short-term leases, right? That's a good way to do that. Um, to create a metaverse without it, I think we can look at stuff like Second Life. You know, it's still around. It's actually much bigger than people expect. It's a lot bigger than all of the crypto metaverses. One of the things they do there is that the land isn't necessarily scarce, right? It expands as needed and locational values might still like attract to it, but um, they don't have the hard speculative problems that you see in these things. Like you can do the land value tax. You can do like short term leases from, um, you know, yourself as the game developer. Um, you can do Harburger taxation. That's a really nerdy approach that, that might work. Um, but you can also dilute land. Right. And if you haven't set yourself up for a revolt, that's been proven to work in a lot of cases. So in the absence of land, I want to talk about like monetization strategies. Like we, we talked about Roblox as being a great example. And I think this is a, the perfect indictment in some ways of this alternative approach that these metaverses are taking because Roblox has infinite land and it's so wildly popular. It's many people's first understanding of a metaverse was understanding Roblox. Right. And so here you have this perfect example. And, and part of the reason it's so huge is network effects. And there's that huge initial upstart cost that you described and you have to get people on there first and it has to be fun for you pay developers to make it fun first. And then, and then more people come. But once you have that network effect, that flywheel is very powerful. We see it in the way social, social network, social media networks have, have succeeded. And so it seems inevitable that the metaphors is that come out most successful will be tapping into those network effects where everyone's there and they have a really strong moat because everyone's there because everyone else is there because everyone else is there. Right. And that's how you cement yourself. That's why Facebook, for all of the reasons I don't think it'll do well with the metaverse, is a formidable foe right. in this metaverse fight because they already have those network effects. Right. Okay, so that's Roblox. But my understanding of how Roblox um, monetizes is is a couple ways, but but a big way is selling Robux. Right. And that's this this centralized currency that you have to keep buying more of from Roblox, the centralized company. Yes. What we're describing here are currencies like an ape coin that once you've bought some ape coin, you're not you know, once once Yuga Labs has Yuga Labs has its, its initial supply, but ultimately I'm buying I'm not buying ape coin from you or from my friend, that's not recurring revenue into the hands of Yuga Labs right. specifically. Are there other monetization strategies that that a Yuga Labs could engage in that isn't selling land and isn't selling the right. currency? So like if we even forget about land, like let's just talk about the apes themselves, right? The whole Yuga Labs business model is based basically on selling passports to the metaverse or plots of land in the metaverse, right? And the problem with this is you have this big upfront sale and it's like trying to run a country club just on upfront purchases, right? Mm. Real country clubs charge subscriptions, folks. That's how it works. Mm. 
you know, because there's ongoing maintenance issues and stuff and, you know, this place isn't going to hoity-toity itself. So, you know, like, <laughs> like, like we, we need to, like, you know, perfect the art of, like, twisting the little, like, sleeves of the sweater and, you know, holding tennis rackets just right. That's not free. So there's subscriptions. There's ongoing costs for that. And so, I mean, subscriptions is one answer. But to put it in sharp relief... They're doing this pre-sale of assets, whatever those assets are, and regardless of how land-like they are, and then it's based on the promise that there's going to be all these benefits. And the promise is that a lot of those benefits are going to come from other people. But where is the incentive for the other people to build those things, right? Why should I honor what is effectively store credit from someone else's store? What's in it for me, right? And so Mm -hmm. some people have talked about, like, there'll be, like, provisions and smart contracts to, like, you know, if you were to honor this or that NFT in your metaverse, like, you would get some kind of something, but there is a real recurring revenue problem that you point out. And I don't have perfect solutions in place, but I think you need to look to successful games. And what they do is that they either are moving to subscriptions like so many uh, uh, live service games are. I call it the subscription hilarity. The subscription hilarity is coming. The moment at which all financial transactions are subscriptions of some sort, um, you know. And then there's also just like making sure there's a reason to have ongoing payments, you know. Um, Ultimately, you can't build a system where more people are taking value out of it, especially in denominated currency than they're putting in. Like people need to receive an exchange at some point that's fairly consumptive. That it's like I put in five dollars and I ate the popcorn and I rode the Ferris wheel and I had fun and I'm happy. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And that. Yeah, totally. You know, it's so funny because you I've read some of your work and I I've listened to you before. We hadn't actually and I'm sure you've written about it, but I hadn't actually read or heard you talk about the alternative options. But I I landed in the same place. Again, I had this whole rant that came out in this morning's episode of the pod and I was like, make it a recurring revenue thing. And, you know, I'm sure there's 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 obviously there's no perfect scenario. Right. There's there's going to be anti web three things with a subscription model. But like. I'm like, it's hilarious. The rest of the business world is obsessed with recurring revenue. That is what every company is is trying to do right now. And we have this funny dynamic in Web3 where it's like buy an NFT one time, lifetime benefits. You know what I mean? Like lifetime access. Like we're, we we follow a very different model right now. Um, and lifetime and then, benefits and, that other people will create. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, that the community is, is, is kind of expected to create in part. I mean, it's you don't have that in every case. You have plenty of NFTs where right. you've got, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk, what he's doing. It's like, you know, buy his NFT for, for basically lifetime access to all the future things that Gary Vaynerchuk wants to build. And, and you're making that bet on him. Um, and then you're making the point, which is another one I made, which is like, okay, I'm, I'm a little bit sick now of, 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 of paying money up front for promised benefits later. Like you've just raised how much money you go labs from VCs, like go build something right. and then ask me for my money. Right. And so <laughs> like, <laughs> another way to like put this is that, um, co-ops, right? So one of the things that I, as much as I am a crypto skeptic, my favorite thing to do is to just hold people to their own standards and take them at their own words and let them believe in their own dreams and see if they're serious, because sometimes they surprise me and it's delightful. Um, so as much as I like to be a critic of Web3, the ponies and unicorn version of Web3 is to actually fulfill this dream of decentralization, you know, because Roblox, like there's rent seeking in Roblox and Roblox is the rent seeker. Right. Instead of hiring private rent seekers, they're just like, we're collecting a higher share of profit than is strictly necessary for us to provide the services we're creating to properly incentivize us to produce that. And there's nothing you can do about it. And our power only increases with every giving day. Right. It would be interesting if you had a community that was able to run a successful UGC platform as a co-op of some sort where it's like it's a producer run co-op. We're all in this together. And if there's any like ground rents that arise and a ground rent economically is a return that is a windfall profit that is much higher than necessary to induce people to produce what they're producing. Um, Then it would be great if that ground rent could belong collectively to the producers, right? You know, this is what happens with every game platform when people like gripe about Steam or Epic or Apple's like cut, they're griping about the fact that it's like they don't really need a cut that big, but they have the leverage and there's no way to stop them. And it would be nice. Imagine what us creators could do if our margins were a little better 
And if there was a system where we collectively owned this thing as producers in some sort of a co-op or something. Yeah. What's well, the cutting out the middleman? It's it's why can't we have more of the reward falling to the producers, creators, rather than the middlemen? And and this will be the the, the last thing I'll say because I you, I want to you got to hop off. But is that that was also the irony to me is that you you've just artificially created a set of middlemen based not on their creative power but rather on the fact that they were free on a Saturday night, and that's the antithesis of right. of the Web three ethos. And I I think that the irony there is um is rich okay i'm gonna uh thank you so much for joining here no problem. thank you so much for watching this episode of overpriced jpegs if you liked this conversation if you liked this episode please go ahead and hit subscribe it helps me out it helps the show out and it means you will get alerts and updates when we post new content thanks again